Hey, everybody. Welcome back to uh, another episode of the Tribunus Plebis podcast. Today, we are going to talk about Gaza. Yes, Gaza. And yes, I'm a little bit late to the game here. Uh, I think I'm going to call this something like breaking my silence on Gaza because I have indeed been silenced or silent on it, on the subject. Uh, not because this is a scary subject, even though it is. It's mostly because I got very sick at the end of the year. And then I've just had, it's been a rough few months. And that sounds silly now that I say it out loud, because we are going to talk about a genocide for the next, whatever, 15, 20 minutes. Uh, these aren't subjects that I ever really wanted to talk about here, but I feel like I have to at this point. Now, this episode is probably going to be a little bit more rough and probably a lot shorter than most. Um, I, I was going to say I don't have a ton of notes, but I do. You're going to see me, you know, looking at them for this whole episode. Uh, but they're not, like, scripted out or really arranged like I normally would. I just wanted this to be a little bit more from the heart, you know? But at the same time, there's a lot of stuff here that I want to get correct, right? I want to get it as correct as possible, so I have notes. Uh, so, you know, just bear with me. As we go through this, I'm not a gifted public speaker by any means. All right, so let's talk about this. Israel has killed over 31,000 Palestinians. 12,000 of them are children. More than a third of the victims of this genocidal assault are children. Both of these numbers are certain to climb as we get recovery, you know, into Gaza to dig through the rubble, to dig through the buildings, the, the fallen, collapsed, bombed out buildings. And that's where we're going to start finding all of the people who are missing, which is thousands of Palestinians are missing right now. And most of them are sure to be dead. Along the way, Israel has destroyed entire communities, entire neighborhoods, um, museums, mosques, um, cultural sites, like old, ancient historical sites, um, schools, hospitals, clinics, bakeries, uh, factories. Just about everything that you can think of is gone. All the schools are gone. Every single university that was in Gaza is gone. Um, you know, and they've all been destroyed with bombs, shells, artillery, machine guns, tank fire. Or, um, did I say artillery? And all of this stuff these missiles, these bombs, these shells, and these bullets, and these planes, and the fuel has been supplied by the United States. That's where I live. I am an American. Sorry, world. Uh, th you know, thousands of children have been orphaned. Thousands have had at least one leg chopped off. Many of those, especially in the later months, had their legs or arms removed without anesthesia. They were awake for the whole thing. In one horrifying video, you can actually see a uh, father sawing off his own child's leg who was awake through the entire thing, the entire ordeal, aware of what's going on. Right now, about 20% of children in Gaza 
under who are under the age of two are now suffering from wasting. Get these off. For those unaware, childhood wasting refers to a child who is too thin for his or her height and is the, it is the result of a recent rapid weight loss or the failure to gain weight. A child who is moderately or severely wasted has an increased risk of death. So mass death, genocide, war crimes, ethnic cleansing, cultural genocide, crimes against humanity. This subject was, or this episode, I guess, this video was hard to even start. Hard to attempt, if I'm being honest. Because the subject matter is just that terrible. You know, I don't, I don't want to have to talk about this stuff. I don't want to talk about this stuff, but, you know, nobody wants to talk about genocide and ethnic cleansing. This isn't, you know, showtime at the Apollo. This is horrible stuff. This doesn't bring me joy. I'm sure it doesn't bring anybody else who's talking about it joy. Um, it doesn't leave me fulfilled, you know, in some weird way or anything, it, but it needs to be talked about. It needs to be talked about um, because it truly is terrible and it needs light shown upon it. And whatever little light I have to give, I want to give it. I want to add it to the growing spotlight that has been on Gaza. Um, I guess the first thing to say that what we are witnessing in Gaza is, in fact, a genocide. It is ethnic cleansing. It is an extended series of war crimes and crimes against humanity. It is, I hope, obviously, something which should be condemned. Um, and our general lack of condemnation around the world for what is going on in Gaza should... It should just hang heavy on our hearts. And I'm sure that it will as the brutality of this ongoing attack sets in. And we should all feel an immense shame for not resisting it hard enough. For not being loud enough. For not ending it before it got to this point. And I don't mean that like individually. You listening to this, it's not your fault that this hasn't stopped. Uh, you know, I just mean it collectively as I want to say as a country, but as a world, as just a mass of humanity. Now, I know that as we get into this, genocide is a very big word. It's not big in syllables. It's not, you know, like a high level vocabulary word, but it's heavy in what comes with it. It's got weight to it, right? Genocide, mass murder. And everybody, when they hear genocide, you ask them, hey, how do you feel about genocide? They say, well, I'm against it, right? They've, they're opposed to genocide. And, but the problem is that we say that we're opposed to genocide, but when it's happening, we refuse to acknowledge that it is genocide. Because if we did acknowledge it, then we would be forced to stop it. And since we don't want to stop it, we can't admit that it is in fact genocide. And that is pretty sick. And as I say that, I know that some people listening to this they want to pull up a definition of the word genocide. And they want to break it down, you know, section by section, line by line, sentence by sentence, even word for word. And they want to say, well, what do they mean by if right here? What do they mean by good? What do they mean by is? 
And they do that because they want to find a way to plausibly say, or at least to plausibly make an argument that this is not genocide. They want to just wring it out and parse it out and say, well, because this that period is right there instead of there. So therefore this isn't genocide, man. And, you know, like, I guess one thing is if you find yourself having to parse out every sentence of the definition of genocide to show that it's not a genocide. And if it takes you 10, 15, 20 minutes to make it plausible, then you've probably done enough work right there to show that it actually is genocide. It shouldn't take that much work to prove otherwise. It takes that much work, somebody's guilty of it. And, you know, while I disagree with that, I guess we can say, like, all right, maybe me pulling up another definition of genocide and trying to parse, trying to convince you that your parsing is different than my, all right, let's just say, (coughs) sorry, let's just say for the sake of argument, that it's not genocide, right? Let's, you know, it would be futile for us to argue over this because we're both going to parse it different ways and whatever. But I would say that I 100% think this is an ethnic cleansing. I think the definition there fits even better. The purposeful removal of people from a land, uh, the destruction of their society and culture with the goal of moving into that area and homogenizing it in your favor in the future. Come on, ethnic cleansing, come on. No? Still no. An entire ethnicity of people are currently being reaped from the earth. Their entire social and cultural ecosystem is being, which, by the way, existed within an open-air prison and refugee camp, is being bombed to rubble as the people who are bombing them demand that they leave the area, pushing them off ever more land, with ever more loss of life and the people who are pushing the Palestinians off being the Israeli state, they are already, or not, maybe not the state, but Israeli people are already talking about buying and selling land in Gaza so that they can build more homes there. The Palestinians of Gaza are in fact being cleansed from Gaza. This is ethnic cleansing. And some people out there still disagree. Still a hard no, right? How about war crimes? The entirety of Gaza is being collectively punished for um, the crimes of, crimes of few. They're being punished with dislocation, trauma, injuries, um, loss of property and wealth, loss of culture, loss of society, amputations, the widowing of spouses, the destruction of families, the orphaning and amputations of children, and death, starvation, famine. And if you aren't down with at least war crimes, crimes against humanity, if you can't agree with at least that, I mean, I really don't know what to say at this point. I mean, we are, we, me and you, are both having a genocide live stream to us daily. It's coming right into our homes. You can literally watch it happen on TikTok or wherever, you know, Twitter, Snapchat, Telegram channels. You can see this. There's no fog of war here. This isn't, you know, happening behind enemy lines on some, you know, continent where nobody knows what's going on. 
Like we have the technology. This is being FaceTime directly to us at the speed of satellite relays and fiber optics and coax cable and Wi-Fi. We can see it. There's no, you know, State Department or newsrooms or newspapers or reporters filtering this. They aren't deciding what we see. We can see it. At least if you're looking for it, if you pay attention. And if all you're doing is watching, you know, Fox and CNN or reading the, the New York Times and you're relying on them to tell you what's going on, then that's part of the problem that we're having. Uh, the country I live in, the United States, they have taken the brave stance of allowing a genocide to be conducted under their watchful gaze. And it gets even worse than that. It's difficult to look at the... Sorry. It's difficult to look at some of the images and imagine that any well-thinking, serious, mature leader would do that. <clears throat> so I can't talk to his psychology, but uh, I think we can all speak to his depravity. This is war. It is combat. It is bloody. It is ugly. And it's going to be messy. And innocent civilians are going to be hurt going forward. I wish I could tell you something different. I wish that that wasn't going to happen. Uh, but it is, it is going to happen. The United States is funding this genocide. And it gets even worse than that. They are supplying it. They are aiding and abetting the Israelis in their genocidal assault on Gaza. So I guess we'll talk about October 7th real quick, since I know many of you are probably thinking about that. Um, I wasn't clapping on October 7th. I wasn't cheering. I know some people cheered, but I just can't do it. Um, maybe I'm too soft. I don't know, but I just can't. Um, a lot of Israelis died that day. I think it was 1,200 civilians plus some attacks on military installations. I'm not sure how many um, military people died, but a lot of human life was lost. But, and I know that there's going to be a lot of people who hear a but here and are going to lose their minds, but the history of the world did not begin on the morning of October 7th of 2023. We cannot ignore the past 80 years or so of history or Zionism from its beginnings in the late, eight, late 19th century, the 1890s, I think. Uh, maybe even a little bit before that. And then it's turbocharging in the 30s and 40s. And then, of course, after World War II, when the, the Holocaust fully came to light. I um, mean, we can't ignore the settler colonization of Palestine, nor can we outright reject the right of the oppressed and occupied to, re to uh, resist their oppressors and occupiers. And yes, I know that viewing October 7th as, you know, both horrible in many ways and in some ways understandable or defensible is a conflict. And no, I don't know how to suss that out entirely. Um, you know, yes, I care. And yes, I truly do believe that the concept of analysis and explanation is not justification is true. But, you know, I mean, it's just, I don't know, I'm conflicted. I'm a human being and I got conflict and I have to try to, you know, deal with that and suss it out. But I don't want violence. I don't want to see people die, even Israelis at raves or in their homes. I don't want to see it. It doesn't bring me great joy. Um, I don't want children dying. But I also don't want to see settlers having, you know, raves outside of these giant, this giant open air prison refugee camp. Uh, which, you know, and the ravers are the actual people who pushed the Palestinians into this giant open air prison. And they're having a rave outside of the fence line. It's kind of gross. 
But all that said, Palestinian people have a right to defend themselves under international law. They have a right to defend themselves from their occupiers and their oppressors. This is just the reality of the situation. And yes, I realize that under those same laws that the oppressed are supposed to operate under the norms of war. But also, let's be real that, you know, when it comes to a measure of relative power here, um, I won't say that no atrocities were committed by Palestinians on October 7th, but let's not pretend that this was the beginning either. And of course, the obvious comeback here is that aren't Israelis allowed to defend themselves? Well, I think that the answer here is that the words defend themselves are doing a lot of goddamn work here. Listen, violence from an occupying force is illegitimate because an occupying force is illegitimate. This isn't two neighbors, you know, like electing mutual combat or something or two adults getting into an argument and one swings and the other defends themselves. This is more akin if I'm forced to reach for and kind of stretch a metaphor or an analogy, I guess here, uh, it's more analogous to a home invasion where the home invader claims self-defense if the homeowner defends their home. You know, one side is the aggressor here. One side has the right to self-defense and it's the occupied. It, so to stretch out my home invasion analogy just a little bit more, make it a little thinner, maybe work even less. But if somebody breaks into a home and they beat up the occupant and they throw that person into a closet and they start living in that house, and then, you know, every once in a while, every couple months, the original homeowner busts out of the closet and attacks him with a coat hanger or a walking stick or something, and the occupier beats him up again and throws him back in the closet and then claims self-defense. We, I think we all know that that situation is, that it's wrong that, you know, the occupier is claiming self-defense. They're, they've physically removed somebody from their property, locked them in a prison, and then they break out of the prison. They fight again. The guy claims self-defense, throws him back in the prison. Again, one side is the aggressor, one side is the occupier, and only one side of that conflict has the right to self-defense. Now, I'm not an expert on, you know, decolonial thought, but that's my take on it. But even if that was the full analysis, that both the Palestinians and the Israelis have the right to defend themselves with violence, Then what? It's just a circular argument all the way around. And the only thing that it will ever come down to is which side you think is right. And let's be real. If, you know, like an Israeli sniper just eye holes an Arab teenager who's at a peaceful march and some Gazan somewhere hears about it and they throw a rock over the fence and it hits an Israeli in the back of the leg and they get a little scratch on their calf. That won't be self-defense, right? The guys in throwing the rock, it won't be self-defense. But if the Israelis then, you know, fire a missile into the crowd, that's self-defense. And I think that perhaps this is the right time to talk about the idea of the perfect victim or ideal victim is the word I was looking for, the ideal victim. Uh, in most societies, the idea of the ideal victim is an entirely innocent person. Just a, you know, like a beautiful, physically beautiful, angelic person who has never done anything wrong, never wronged anybody, who is loved by everybody that they know, um, has never wronged anybody in their life. And this perfect person is just going along about their day, going to the hair salon, 
to get their, you know, perm done <laughs> by their best friend who she also tips well. And on the way, she gets attacked through no fault of her own. You know, that's the ideal victim, somebody that we can really empathize with and sympathize with. And we feel like we know. But th these people, they just don't exist. The ideal victim is not a real thing. But the closer a victim comes to that ideal, the more of their story that we will hear and sympathize with. And this is why, you know, the beautiful blonde prom queen, 18 year old who disappears on a tropical island or something, will get hundreds of hours of TV news time and dozens of true crime podcasts about her story. And it's the reason why a less attractive, unpopular black girl who disappears in her own town will get the briefest of mentions on page 34 of the local paper, if she's lucky, and nobody outside of the town she lives in will ever hear about it. And we can even look to people who are murdered by the police as another example of this. Uh, you know, like when George Floyd was killed by that cop, what was the first thing that those who want to refuse to acknowledge bad cops just clung on to desperately when it came to George Floyd? It was that he had a criminal record, right? They just kept... Like, why do you care if this guy died? He's a criminal. He has a rap sheet. You know, screw that guy. And they use it to deflect from the fact that a cop killed him. And there will never be, you know, an ideal victim or an authority like a cop. Or, or a state like Israel. It will never exist. This is why do you condemn Hamas is such a recurring question. If you acknowledge that a small group of Palestinians did something wrong, then they use that to besmirch the rest of the population. It's guilt by association. Guilt by living on you know, one of the most densely populated areas on the planet. Sure, people will say something like, no, these people aren't all Hamas terrorists, but they know them. They live near them. They aren't killing the Hamas people. They aren't turning the Hamas people in. They sell them food. They give them haircuts. Uh, like I said, guilt by association. Just... Guilt by living near them, on top of them, under them. And remember, this is one of the most densely populated areas on the planet. You, it's, Even if you wanted to like say, like, I don't want to live near somebody with a gun. How do you do that in a place like this? You can't. There's no like countryside you can run to. There's no suburban development to move to. And once you inextricably link the Palestinian people to somebody who's done something bad, then from there, it's collective punishment, which is a war crime. And all that said, I think we need a bigger view here. It's the Pal it's, it is the Palestinians who were displaced. It is the Palestinians who have been herded into Gaza, walled off, fenced off, prevented from leaving, um, or at least heavily restricted from leaving. Um, you know, somebody else controls their prison who goes in and out, what gets in and out, what they can own, what they can't. They are, in fact, prisoners. They do, in fact, live in an open-air refugee camp prison. And if anybody, I guess, hearing this, is sympathetic to this idea. I would like to suggest that you Google, I'm trying to think of the name, it was uh, Gaza Fights for Freedom. It's a film by Abby Martin. It is amazing. Watch it. Uh, the Palestinians are also in the occupied West Bank, which constant, which 
is constantly encroached on by illegal Israeli settlements, which take up more and more of that land and push those people onto you know, an ever smaller portion of the West Bank. The Palestinians do not, in fact, have even a tiny percentage of the power that the Israelis do. It is they who are occupied and caged and displaced, and all this continues even now as more and more settlements take place in the West Bank. More and more Palestinians and Arabs are evicted from their homes. Uh, For Jewish people who are using their right of return to throw even more people out of, you know, out onto the streets and into ever dwindling and ever more densely packed parcels of land. This has to be acknowledged as well. What else has, what else? Sorry. (laughs) Uh, What else has to be acknowledged is that an actual state, whether we view it as legitimate or not, a state with a large, well-funded, well-armed, well-maintained, highly advanced, and well-trained army has declared, quote-unquote, war with a refugee camp. And now, because of that so-called war, Gaza is being obliterated from the map, and the people within it are being driven towards another country, Egypt, herded there by violence and starvation. Uh, Since October 7th, We've seen over 30,000 Palestinians killed. I think the last I saw was a little over 31,000 official numbers. Uh, The majority of those people are women and children. Like I said, I think children are 12,000, more than a third. And most of the rest are women. I've seen uh, numbers saying that two-thirds of all of the dead are women and children. And these numbers are, again, likely on the low side. As we people go back into Gaza and find the bodies under the rubble, it will go up. This is genocide. At least 2 million people out of a population of 2.2 million people have been displaced. This is genocide. Half of Gaza's population are on the verge of starvation as Israel blocks aid shipments at the border crossing. Oftentimes, these uh, aid shipments and these entrances to Gaza are being blocked by Israeli citizens, not even the military. They're making picnics of it. They're bringing their families. And when they stop trucks, they sit down in their chairs and they cheer. They say things like, good, starve them. They can die. They're animals. They're vermin. This is genocide. Democracy Now! recently reported that at least 23 people have been murdered by these policies and starved to death. Of those 23 dead, 20 of them are children. Or were children. I should use a past tense just to hammer home the uh, point here. This is genocide. The UN is predicting that if conditions hold as they are, there will be 2,000 people dying per day due to starvation by May. This is genocide. Since the Israeli strikes began and through February 1st, more than 10 children per day have lost at least one appendage, the vast majority of them being legs. Many of them have had both legs amputated. 10 children per day have had amputations. And like I said, for a lot of that time, there were no anesthetics to give these children, so they were fully awake and aware of what was going on as their legs were being removed. Often in non-sterile environments because so many hospitals have been bombed. This is genocide. Israel bombed the last remaining UNRWA uh, aid station recently where they murdered five aid workers. The IDF has fired on civilians waiting on aid, uh, killing many and injuring many more. I wrote milling instead of killing there. Sorry, it threw me off. Um, Over 168 workers have been killed by the IDF since the assaults began, something which causes other aid workers and their organizations to cease sending help out of fear. This is either done on purpose or with little regard or no regard because the end result is beneficial to Israel. And whether it's intentional or not, the results remain. 
This is a war crime. This is genocide. The air dropped aid into the uh, the U.S. This is a great story. The U.S. air dropped aid. Some of it went into the sea off the coast of Gaza, and desperate people tried to swim to retrieve some of the goods in those boxes. But before they got there, Israel bombed all of the shipments that landed in the sea. This is a crime against humanity. This is genocide. Israel has bombed hospitals, schools, food markets, bakeries, food stores, and mosques. More than more than 50% of all buildings in Gaza are destroyed. I lost my note place. This is embarrassing. More than 50% of all buildings and structures in all of Gaza have been leveled at this point. Museums have been raised. Ancient sites have been bombed. History, art, culture, they've all been wiped from the face of the earth forever. This is ethnic cleansing. The, this is a war crime. Millions driven from their homes, tens of thousands dead, tens of thousands more injured, orphaned, amputated, starved. Tens of that, I've seen thousands, thousands missing, probably dead. This is ethnic cleansing. This is genocide. There is no argument that this is some sort of proportional or justified response to October 7th. There just simply is no argument for that. This is a clear cut example of, sorry, this is a clear cut example of collective punishment. This is a war crime. This is genocide. Israel is preventing journalists from entering Gaza. The U.S. media is utterly failing to magnify what is truly going on. These are all war crimes. This is all genocide. Israel is doing their best to prevent media from entering Gaza, and I think that's important. It highlights the intense efforts that they are making to deny the charge of genocide in particular, and the very slightly less offensive term ethnic cleansing. And they're resisting this along with things like war crimes and crimes against humanity. And if I'm right in how I'm viewing this, they simply have to maintain that facade. They, they have to. And one of the main reasons, to my eye at least, is something that I've talked about a little bit so far, but it's Israel is so furiously opposed to the labels of ethnic cleansing and genocide in particular that it's because they recognize just how distasteful it is. And this doesn't just relate to the Holocaust of World War II and the suffering and murder of the Jewish people which happened in it. No, I think it's actually a little bit darker than that in some ways. The powers that be, both in Israel and their supporters like Germany, the United States, and other nations, they all sit on the firm stance of opposing genocide. Never again, never another genocide. They all say it, at least on paper. That's a core belief that they all say that they hold. But there's another aspect of this as well, I think. And that is the, I guess, the weaponization of accusations of anti-Semitism. Anti-Semitism is very real. And, you know, it can run concurrently with criticism of Israel, the state. But it doesn't have to, it doesn't always run concurrently. Uh, I've talked about how bad anti-Semites are on previous episodes here. I don't agree with them. I think that they're all awful people. But at the same time, you can say Israel has, you know, done something immoral or wrong or hasn't done enough of, of something, and it doesn't make you anti-Semitic at all. Uh, this is the same reason why, even as the Arabs are being physically destroyed by laser-guided bombs, sniped from the hills, shot at aid stations, and starved to death, the media tries to focus on the tears of, you know, young, pretty, blonde Israeli girls on college campuses who are upset that protesters are asking the world, asking Israel to stop murdering Palestinians. So they're asking for a ceasefire and it reduces people to tears. You know, if a student in Palo Alto is upset that their fellow students want a genocide to end, then that 
is more important. Those crocodile tears are more important than tens of thousands of dead Palestinians. It's more important to make a 19-year-old college student feel better about themselves than it is to stop a genocide from which is actually occurring. Never again has never been true in this sense. You know, we've seen other genocides, but these, you know, states and leaders and most of humanity agrees with the sentiment that if there is a genocide going on, that it should be stopped. Everybody agrees with that statement, right? If there's a genocide, it has to stop. It's pretty clear cut. I don't know anybody who would say that they disagree with that. Um, and I think that right here is the crux of the issue. If we agree it's a genocide, then we are obligated to make sure that it ends. We are obligated to make sure that it stops. The world would be obligated to stop Israel from genociding Gaza, from the destroying the Palestinian people. The world knows this. We all understand what I just said. If there's a genocide, it has to stop. The United States knows this. Germany knows this. Uh, Germany knows that if they admit that this is a genocide, then they have to stop it. You know, the U.S. knows this too, but none of them want to admit it. And I'm not saying that any of these countries are pure of heart and that they actually mean this. But it would at least put them in a little bit of a pickle between their rhetoric and their actions and make them at least uncomfortable, right? At least a little bit, maybe. But Israel wants to continue this genocide. The States, the United States and Germany, you know, in other countries, the Western world, they want Israel to continue this genocide. They have to, they're letting them. The U.S. is sending massive amounts of weaponry to Israel to support their assault. I refuse to call this a war, by the way. This is just a genocidal assault on Gaza and the Palestinian people. Um, Germany has massively increased weapons uh, sales to Israel uh, for the same reasons. The West is aiding a genocide, and they're justifying it by calling the obliteration of a prison camp of one of the most densely populated places on earth by a state military self-defense. It's preposterous. We are watching it happen on real time, live on our computers and TVs, and we just sit by. Our leaders sit by. The country sit by. The Biden, well, actually, you know what? It's not, I misspoke. We're not sitting by. The countries aren't sitting by. The Biden administration is supporting the genocide. They are sending ammunition to help Israel achieve their ultimate goal of wiping Gaza as we know it off the map in an effort to reduce the Palestinian people to as low a population number as they possibly can. Biden could actually put a stop to this by demanding that the murdering stop and stopping all aid, save maybe humanitarian, until it does. Uh, but he won't do that. He is both a political coward and also financially tied and supported by a lobby which is happy to allow this genocide to happen. Israel says that they are taking all steps to avoid civilian death. That's a quote. They tell people to flee the areas that they intend to bomb and then attack the refugee convoys which they force people to create. Palestinian whom... <clears throat> Sorry. Palestinian human rights activist Raji Surani, who lived in Gaza City, wrote this about the Israeli attempts to supposedly not kill civilians. Quote, We have tried to move south to the so-called safety zone. In a convoy, we drove along the coastal road waving white flags. The road was lined with many dead bodies and burned out vehicles. After just five minutes on the road, we came under fire. End quote. Under fire from Israel. Israel has also attacked crowds attempting to collect food and supplies from aid convoys. 
In one attack, they killed over a hundred desperate, starving, dislocated Palestinian civilian refugees. They shot them with guns and then sent tanks in, which, according to eyewitnesses, rolled over the bodies of both the dead and wounded. This is now being referred to as the Flower Massacre, where Israeli troops opened fire on these desperate people and killed 118 people and left another 760 injured. Originally, Israel denied this story. Here's another thing about Israel. Then they said that the Palestinians all injured themselves when they stampeded. And a few, there were a few other variations you know, along the way, but the last official account I can find is that the Israelis admitted that they fired into the crowd, but they said that they only did so because the soldiers were scared. And what finally got the Israelis to admit the truth? Was it the witness testimony? No. Was it their own conscience? Nope. It was the confirmation by, um, what do you call them, like aid groups, I guess, that the, of those injured during the flower massacre, the, the people who made it to hospitals and clinics, over 80% of them had bullet holes in their bodies. So 80% of those injured had been shot. 80% of 760 people were shot. And many of the dead, they appeared to have been killed by tank shells and aircraft ammunition. This crowd was fired upon by tanks and aircraft. And of those who were run over by the tanks and trucks, witnesses say that many of them were wounded but still alive as they went under the vehicles. The ease with which the Israeli state lies about killing is rivaled only by the ease with which they can justify these atrocities. This is from a Jacobin article by Yuval Abraham. Quote, As leaked analysis by the Dutch defense attaché in Tel Aviv put it, Israel intends to deliberately cause enormous destruction to the infrastructure and civilian centers. Within the IDF, strikes of this nature are called power targets. If you want to find a way to turn a high-rise into a target, you will be able to do so, explained a former intelligence official quoted in the report. Official claims that such targets are tied to Hamas are, quote, an excuse that allows the army to cause a lot of destruction in Gaza, end quote, said a source who had said a source who was involved in developing targets in previous rounds of fighting in Gaza. That is what they told us. End quote. This goes along with dozens of Israeli officials, both in the government and military, who say similar things. I'm going to read a few of them here. And I'm going to probably mispronounce some of these names, and I apologize deeply for that. I do not speak Hebrew. I'm sorry. Um, Amakai Eliyahu, the Israeli Minister of Heritage, said on November 1st of 2023, the north of the Gaza Strip, more beautiful than ever. Everything is blown up and flattened, simply a pleasure for the eyes. We must talk about the day after. In my mind, we will hand over lots to all those who fought for Gaza over the years and to those evicted from Gush Katif. He went on to say that, quote, there is no such thing as uninvolved civilians in Gaza, end quote. He also suggested a nuclear attack on Gaza. This is collective punishment. This is a war crime. This is genocide. Avi Dichter, Israeli Minister of Agriculture, said in a, telev- said in a television interview, um, recalling the Nakba of 1948, in which over 80% of the Palestinian population of the new Israeli state was forced from or fled their homes, stating that we are now actually rolling out the Gaza Nakba. 
ethnic cleansing. Netanyahu personally pledged at a meeting of Knesset deputies in late December that he was working to ensure that those who want to leave Gaza to a third country can do so, according to news site Israel Hayom, adding that the matter needs to be settled because it had strategic importance for the day after the war. This is the intentional forced relocation um, and displacement of people from land, one of the criteria for genocide. Netanyahu stated it like a free choice. I say forced because they are being chased and herded with artillery fire, machine guns, and bombs towards the Egypt border, and then they are being told, die or go. Israel wants the Palestinians to go to Egypt so that Israel is a is as close to a pure ethno state as possible. This is ethnic cleansing. This is genocide. Quote. This again is from Jacobin. Retired general and former head of the security council, Giora Island said this, this is what Israel has begun to do. We cut the supply of energy, water, and diesel to the strip, but it's not enough. In order to make the siege effective, we have to prevent others from giving assistance to Gaza. The people should be told that they have two choices, to stay and to starve or to leave. If Egypt and other countries prefer that these people will perish in Gaza, this is their choice. Island has repeatedly been given a media platform to call for Gaza to be made uninhabitable, declaring the state of Israel has no choice but to make Gaza a place that is temporarily or permanently impossible to live in. End quote. That's the end of the Jacobin quote. This is that this is ethnic cleansing. This is genocide. These are war crimes. Israeli army Colonel Yogev Barshashet. Yeah, I think that's right. Yogev Barshashet stated, Whoever returns here, if they return hereafter, will find scorched earth. No houses, no agriculture, nothing. They have no future. Another army colonel recorded in the same video as Barsheshet, Colonel Erez Eschel, also commented that vengeance is a great value. There is vengeance over what they did to us. This place will be a fallow land they will not be able to live here. And there is more. There's a lot more, but I think you get the point. This is ethnic cleansing. This is genocide. These are, in fact, war crimes, crimes against humanity. And listen, I don't want to sit here and you know list quotes and stats for a full hour. I think that's probably enough for now. Um, I think that we probably all get the point here. Nothing I'm saying is new or shocking. And as far as I know, none of it is factually incorrect. And, you know, I may have faults here. Um, I may not, you know, be perfect. I may not think about things perfectly. But one thing I do always try to do, or I was going to say always do, but I always try to be honest and truthful with you. I try not to lie. Um, If I get something wrong, please hit me up in the comments or social media. I am not an expert on this stuff. I want to get it right. This situation isn't something I take lightly nor are the words that I'm speaking to you. You know, I desperately want to be accurate here. But what, we're, what Israel is doing here is on purpose. Um, this isn't a case of human shields or missiles in homes. If an out-and-out bad guy is hiding behind a civilian and you shoot through that innocent person's chest to kill the bad guy, you've made a choice. You're doing it on purpose, a choice to murder that innocent person in pursuit of your goals. And if you then go on to blow up the bad guy's house with his family inside of it and then neighbor's houses just because they know him and, you know, all of the places and businesses that surround them and then, you know, retroactively come up with reasons to do it. You've also made a choice. Israel is making a choice here, the wrong choice. But it is a choice. And when you make that choice, You are culpable for all of that death. You are culpable for the genocide. You are culpable for the suffering. And the suffering in Gaza right now is immense. 
Uh, they have starvation and famine. Like I said before, uh, 23 people have died of starvation so far as of yesterday. I believe I read that first story. 20 of those dead are children, and it's only going to get worse. The supposed food that the lucky ones manage to get is often little more than slop or even years old canned food that tastes more of tin than they do of whatever food that is supposedly within those cans. Um, you know, and even like the fresher food, the better food, it, it's just being kind of, it doesn't look much better as it's being just sloshed into dirty buckets or whatever containers people can find. There is, you know, video out there of children, you know, sticking their hands into just the dirt on the side of the road where flower bags had leaked from trucks, which are transporting aid deeper into Gaza. And they're just taking this, you know, 50, 50 mixture of sand and flour and literally just putting it in their pockets so that they can try to get it home and make something out of it. And so as I guess we wrap this up, we come to an end here. Let's take a few minutes to really consider the lives of these people. And they are people. They're not vermin or monsters or evil or some weird other like the Israelis are telling us. They're just people. They're Palestinian people who live in Gaza. They're human beings just trying to survive. There are not enough bathrooms. I doubt showers are even existent for nearly everybody, but I, you know, I heard a woman talking about people spending an entire day waiting for a bathroom. And this might seem absurd, you know, a days long line to go to the bathroom, but this, it actually connects with a story I read about a refugee camp in Greece where people were choosing not to defecate for multiple days before losing an entire day to waiting to use a porta potty or an outhouse. I think it was an outhouse, they said. So they would get up, you know, when the sun rose after not using a bathroom for multiple days and just wait in a line, slowly trudging forward and hopefully getting in before nightfall. In Gaza, food and clean water are scarce. People are living in sandy tents, eating like slop or metal flavored tin foods that too often smell and taste rancid and all of this with even more sand in it. Orphan children finding comfort where they can, mothers who've lost their children and husbands who wandering around, who are wandering around <laughs> looking for food, for, looking for their friends, family, anything. And when a food truck arrives in Gaza and these people turn out to get some flour or potable rice or potable rice, potable water or rice, they don't get the flour. They get bullets. They get shot. They get shelled by tanks. They get run over by tanks. They get machine gunned by soldiers. And we here in the States, in the United States, have the gall to say, no, this is not ethnic cleansing. This is not a war crime. These aren't crimes against humanity. We deny that this is a genocide. We insist that this collective, brutal, violent punishment of millions of innocent human beings, a collective punishment consisting of death, Sniper fire, shellings, bombings, artillery fire, machine gunnings, starvation and famine, depredation and humiliation, a collective punishment of cultural, social, familial, and physical obliteration. We insist that it is justified. We insist that it's not genocide. And then we turn around and we arm the very people who are, in fact, committing these atrocities. 
And then we say, hey, we will build a dock on the coast of Gaza and help bring more aid, and we will pretend that we are humanitarians. Gaza is being decimated, ethnically cleansed, and genocided. And we offer to build a military base on their coast and toss whoever may be left a few bags of flour as payment. We say this is humanitarian aid, but really it's aid to genocide. And meanwhile, we send genocide aid, like direct aid, to the war criminal state-level terrorists in Israel. We send ships and planes full of weapons to Israel to further the destruction and displacement of Gazans and the Palestinian people, and we, we promise the beleaguered Palestinians a beachhead for an American base. That's how fucking disgusting we are. From the river to the sea, Palestine will be free.